so good morning to everyone all of the students who are here today we are going to discuss about uh, the new chapter in bi biozoology that also included in zoology that is respiration chapter number 6 so under this respiration we are going to discuss about these following subtopics respiratory functions respiratory organ in various organisms mechanism of breathing exchange of gases and transport of gases today we are going to discuss all those thing, topics okay now we'll move on to the respiration so why we need respiration so what they are discussed in this particular slide 92 pages why we need respiration normally when you are able to take food you know, from the food we are able to get energy from the food we are able to get energy so how the energy is being derived from the food only by a process of breathing by a process of breathing, it is usually helps to transport the oxygen from the environment into the uh, cells. Okay, so by breathing, the oxygen will be transported from the external environment into the body cells. And in the cells, the food which has been taken is being oxidized or break down in the presence of this oxygen obtained from environment, and it results in the and it results in the uh, breakdown of these macromolecules to produce or release energy okay so what is the need of uh, respiration only by respiration the energy only only by respiration the breakdown of macromolecules okay usually will take place because the oxygen is needed and that is being produced only from respiration and through that oxygen obtained from respiration the breakdown of macromolecules like uh, glucose and other macromolecules will be takes place and it causes a release of energy okay so for that uh, we need the process of respiration okay apart from this uh, when the energy is been released by the breakdown of these uh, food particles a lot of uh, harmful substances like carbon dioxide will also be get produced these harmful substances like carbon dioxide it has to be removed from our body cell that is also been takes place because of respiration okay so now we have to see what are the different uh, uh, what is that functions of your respiration so there are five primary functions of your respiration okay they are number one is it to exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the blood so from the atmosphere uh, the oxygen as well as the carbon dioxide will be exchanged okay between the atmosphere and the blood that is the first step in your respiration process the second important step is the, through the respiration the homeostatic regulation of body ph okay it is used to maintain the homeostatic regulation of your body ph so your body ph has been usually steady steadily maintained the third important process of your respiration is it protect us from the inhaled pathogen and pollutants so mainly when you are able to inhale a lot of airborne pollutants as well as pathogens will be present so these uh, pathogens and the pollutants are usually being protected by this particular type of respiration fourth important function is it maintains the vocalization or it maintains the communication the normal communication of the humans are usually being done only with the help of your important respiration functions through the vocal cords and the final function is it removes the heat that is produced during cellular respiration it, re it removes the heat that is produced during cellular respiration these are the important functions of your respiration okay so the respiratory organisms what, what is the respiratory organisms in various organisms how it is taking place so the respiratory organisms in different uh, different animals have different respiratory organs okay so the exchange of gases usually takes place by different methods and that uh, the difference in the uh, what is that uh, respiration is mainly because of the level of organization as well as their habitat so their habitat and the level of organization plays an imagine important role for the difference in the uh, 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 difference in the respiratory organ with respect to different animals so the amount of dissolved oxygen is very low in water when compared to that of oxygen in the air so basically water will have the uh, oxygen in the form of dissolved form that is the dissolved oxygen so the amount of dissolved oxygen in water is very low in compared to that of that is present in the air so as a result the breathing rate of the aquatic organisms that is which is present in the water will be very high 
and compare that of the organisms uh, that is present in the land. Because in land there is more amount of uh, oxygen is available, so the breathing rate in the animals which is present in land will be normal. Whereas in the, the animals which is present in the water, that is in the aquatic uh, environment, they will have a very high fast uh, rate of breathing because of the low amount of the oxygen in the water. So now we have seen the, how the breathing rate is taking place in the organisms. Okay. So now what are the different organs uh, that are present in each and every organisms for its respiration? Okay. That's what we are going to discuss here. So in animals like sponges, cylindrates and flatworms, the exchange of gases usually takes place by simple body surface. So simply from the surface of your body, the water, uh, the oxygen or the respiration usually or the exchange of gases usually takes place. That is simple by simple diffusion. Through the body surface by simple diffusion, the exchange of uh, the gases usually takes place. For example, if you take earthworm, they use their moist skin. The moist, through their moist skin, the earthworms are able to exchange their gases. If you take insects, they will have an, uh, the respiratory organs such as tracheal tubes. They will be having a tube called as a tracheal tube. So through these tracheal tubes, the insects are able to undergo respiration. So the organism that is living in the aquatic environment, like arthropods and mollusks, no? they used to be able to undergo respiration by gills. So gill is an important organism in the organisms that are living in the aquatic environment. So next one is come to the vertebrates, the animals that are having the backbones. No? Mainly fishes, they use gills. Okay? Mainly fishes use gills because they are living in water. So it's an exceptional case in case of vertebrates, the fishes use gills. Other than this, the amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, they have a well-developed vascular vascularized lungs. They will have well-developed vascularized lungs are present in case of vertebrates. Okay. Next, when you come to this uh, frog, no? the frog is called as a amphibians. They live both in water as well as in the land. So, they have uh, uh, lungs uh, as well as the moist skin. So, they have a uh, lungs as well as moist skin as a respiratory organ for the exchange of gases. So, with this, uh, we have understood what is the uh, respiratory organs in different various organisms. Next, we'll move on to the human respiratory systems. So, we are going to discuss about the human respiratory systems. Okay. The human respiratory systems usually starts with the external nostrils or nose. Okay. It usually starts with the external nostrils or nose and it, uh, it is usually having uh, pro proceed with the nasal cavity. So, there will be having a very big cavity that is your mouth, tongue, everything comes under this nasal cavity and from the nasal cavity, it passes through the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles and the lungs. Okay, finally, it will be ending with the lungs and the lungs is usually having this presence of alveoli. So, if you want to know this, you can see this uh, picture 6.1. So, you will be having a mouth or a nasal pharynx here. It will be entering into the nasal cavity and then it will be entering into the pharynx, then larynx, through the larynx, uh, the uh, what is that, the respiratory uh, uh, what is the system usually opens with the, your uh, larynx through the glottids. Okay, from the larynx it is able to travel through the trachea, the trachea bran branches into two bronchi and the bronchi is further able to undergo branches. So, we are going to see all those things. Okay, so now we are going to see how this uh, uh, system is able to, respiratory system in humans are going to work. Okay, so first the first part that is starting with your uh, respiratory, human respiratory system is the external nostrils. Okay, from the external nostrils. Uh, the uh, respiratory system in humans usually will starts and it usually ends with the terminal bronchioles okay so from the external no nostrils till the terminal bronchioles we call this as a conductive zone we call this a conductive zone and from the alveoli to the from the alveoli duct as well as the alveoli we collectively call as a respiratory zone so the human respiratory system itself they are classifying into two types the one is called as a conductive zone, another one is called as a respiratory zone. The conductive zone usually starts from the external nose and it usually ends with the uh, terminal bronchioles. Whereas uh, the respiratory zone usually uh, starts with the alveoli duct and it finally ends with the alveoli. Sometimes the uh, re respiratory zone includes uh, the respiratory bronchioles, alveoli duct and then followed by the alveoli. So they sometimes they call it as a respiratory zone. Okay. So the mainly the part of the conductive zone that is from the external nostrils to the uh, terminal bronchioles, no? they usually 
uh, what is actually main function is that they humidifies the incoming air and, and it keeps the incoming air very warm that is the main role of your conductive zone now you see how the air enters and how it is able to travel through the external nose to the uh, what is that uh, lungs okay first is the air usually enters from your mouth through the nasal cavity from the nasal cavity the air enters from the nasal cavity into the uh, your uh, nasopharynx through the nasopharynx the air again travels from the nasopharynx into the larynx through glottids the glottid is a, a part that is present here that glottids will be able to transport the air coming from the nasopharynx into the larynx okay nasopharynx is a, a part of a pharynx okay and it is uh, and uh, uh, it is able to end with the glottids so pharynx is a common path for both food as well as the air passage okay so now from through the nasopharynx the air enters into the larynx through glottids okay so these uh, when you are able to take food are able to take food so when you are able to swallow the food the presence of a small flap like structure called as epiglottids will be present here and these epiglottids will be present above the glottids and it will uh, and it, when you are able to take food and you are able to swallow these epiglottids will just try to cover the particular glottids which is a starting point of your respiratory uh, tract okay it will just cover the glottids uh, so that the water the, so that the food which is taken by uh, us will not be able to enter into the uh, respiratory tract and it will not able to form the choking of the respiratory tract okay so epiglottids is a small flap like structure that prevents the flow of food from the uh, your, through your mouth and entering into the respiratory tract next once the larynx is you are able to see so mainly the larynx is able to proceed and it forms the ends of the trachea so trachea is called as a here we call it as a windpipe okay larynx is called as a uh, voice box pharynx is called as a uh, food uh, it is a uh, pharynx is meant for the transport of food a larynx is meant for the transport of the uh, oxygen or air so uh, larynx is in the trachea and it is called as a windpipe the trachea is further is branching into two important branches and uh, in the thoracic region and we call this as a bronchus okay so this is a structure of your uh, entry of your structure of your respiratory system okay next we'll come to this uh, trachea the ciliated epithelium cells are usually lining the trachea so you'll be having a ciliated epithelium cells that is usually lining the trachea bronchi bronchioles and and uh, the uh, and mainly you are able to see the presence of mucus here okay so you are able to see trachea bronchi and bronchioles you see here the structure of your trachea bronchi and the bronchioles so you have a trachea here and the trachea is able to branch here as left uh, bronchus and the, this is the left bronchus and this is the right bronchus in this figure they have shown only about the left bronchus so say it is the first bronchus it is called the left primary bronchus okay so you will be having a trachea trachea branches and it forms a bronchi two bronchi will be formed so this is a right bronchi and this is a left bronchi so they have only shown the picture of a left bronchi okay so this left bronchi further branches here see the left bronchi is traveling here again it branches here and it forms a secondary bronchi okay again the secondary bronchi is able to travel up to here and here it is able to have a branch okay here it is able to have a branch and it called as a trimeri bronchi the trimeri bronchi further it be able to uh, move and it is able to further branches here and it forms a bronchioles okay so you have a primary bronchi secondary bronchi tertiary bronchi and finally it is able to end with uh, able to branch and forms a bronchioles and the bronchioles further is able to travel and it forms a terminal bronchioles terminal bronchioles further able to proceed and forms a very a bronchiole called as a respiratory bronchioles and then finally it ends with the alveoli is it clear so what they trying to say is that from the trachea till the bronchioles okay till the bronchioles you may you may be having the presence of the uh, what is that epithelial ciliated epithelial cells you will be having a presence of ciliated epithelial cells so these ciliated epithelial cells they are usually having a cells called as a globet cells these globet cells will be able to secrete mucus are able to see 
see these are ciliated epithelial cells they are able to have globed cells and these globed cells are able to secrete mucus mucus is a slimy uh, material that is rich in glycoprotein okay so this mucus which is produced by the ciliated epithelial cells so the ciliated epithelial cells is always called as a mucus membrane or mucosa it will be having a globed blood cells these globed cells which is present in this uh, mucus membrane secret mucus and it is a slimy material rich in glycoprotein so what is the role of this slimy material that is coating from the trachea to the bronchi any paro any pathogens and or dust particles able to enter through your respiratory tract so okay these particular pathogens will be trapped in this particular mucus and it will be carried up way and it will be carried up way and it will be transported to the uh, what is it esophagus and finally it will be swallowed and it will be uh, what is that released outside by means of coughing okay this is the way the respiratory systems able to uh, what is that remove the pathogens and dust particles that is entering into your respiratory tract so we already discussed about this uh, epiglottids okay next the trachea when you just move on no, next we'll move on to the trachea so what is the trachea the trachea is a semi flexible tube that is supported by multiple cartilages rings so you be having a presence of multiple cartilages rings called as a trachea you see here multiple cartilages rings are present this is trachea so this trachea is usually supported by multiple cartilages ring okay so this uh, cartilages rings uh, along with the trachea is able to pro, uh, what is that uh, prolong and it will be able to travel up to the uh fifth thoracic vertebrae so this is a thoracic region this is a head region so fifth up to fifth thoracic uh, vertebrae this trachea will be traveling and then finally it will divide into right and left bronchi okay and each bronchi usually able to travel into the lungs okay so we already discussed that the trachea is tra tra able to undergo bra branches and it into primary right bronchi and primary left bronchi and each bronchi will enter into the lungs okay now within the lungs the bronchi divides repeatedly into secondary tertiary and further into terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles which we already showed in the diagram i already showed in the diagram next bronchi also have a c shaped curved cartilages plates to ensure the air which does not pass or collapse okay you will be having a presence of cartilages plates you see here there are a lot of cartilages plates are present okay these cartilages presence of these cartilages plates are present and it usually prevents the collapse of the air when the air is able to pass through the trachea into the bronchi bronchioles the collapsing of your air will not takes place or sometimes the bursting of this respiratory tract may happen because of the change in the air pressure so this bursting or collapsing of air will not takes place because of the presence of this cartilages plates next the bronchi without cartilages uh, rings okay you will be having a, a bronchi bronchi sorry you will be having a bronchioles up to bronchi you will be having a cartilages plates starting from trachea it will be uh, the cartilages plates will be available till the bronchi that is uh, up to tertiary bronchi the cartilages plates will be there after the tertiary bronchi is able to branches it forms a bronchioles so bronchioles will not will not be having this cartilages plates but they will be having the uh, presence of these uh, muscles that is smooth muscles okay and it also be very highly rigid because the bronchioles are having a high rigidity and it prevents this this rigidity will prevents the particular bronchioles from collapsing apart from this they also have a smooth muscles these smooth muscles it will try to uh, contract and relax based on the uh, what is that uh, amount of uh, the air pressure okay so it is able to adjust the diameter and as a result it will prevents the collapsing of your bronchioles next to the fine respiratory bronchioles so terminal bronchioles after that it is able to finally able to branch and it forms a respiratory bronchioles so the respiratory bronchioles the fine respiratory bronchioles are finally terminate into a highly vascularized thin walled pouch like air sacs so these respiratory bronchioles are able to form a thin walled pouch like air sacs small a bag like structure okay and they usually have a highly vascularized so this bag like structure will be having more amount of a capillary network of blood vessels will be supplied in that and we call this a pouch like air sacs called a alveoli so so this structure is called as a alveoli 
so you'll be having a terminal bronchiole a respiratory bronchiole and it finally ends with a small pouch like structure and it is called as a alveoli and you see this alveoli here is a magnificent structure of your of your alveoli or alveolus and you'll be having a rich supply of the vascularized alveoli vascularized means presence of blood supply will be there so you'll be having a capillaries no you have small red color is the capillaries so these capillaries are able to uh, this is a blue color called as the veins because these capillaries are being supplied with this alveoli so we have a bag like structure called as a alveoli that are highly vascularized okay now we have to see what is the important uh, functions of this alveoli so, or this small bag like structure okay these small bag like structures are called as alve alveoli and it is a site for the gaseous exchange so mainly the carbon dioxide or the oxygen which is traveling from the atmosphere into the lungs and in the end of the lungs it is finally travel and to the end and finally travels at the end of the lungs it is usually ends with your alveoli so this alveoli is a site where the exchange of the oxygen or carbon dioxide okay the exchange of oxygen or carbon dioxide in one term you can say exchange of gases so the exchange of gases usually takes place in the uh, alveoli especially with the alveoli of your lungs with the blood rbc of your blood vessels so it is a site for the exchange of alveoli so it's a site for the exchange of gases okay that is the main important functions of your alveoli so this is a structure and is a site for exchange of mainly the gases okay so what this alveoli is mainly made up of this alveoli is are usually made up of three important uh, uh, what is that layers okay what are the three important layers this alveoli is mainly made up of it is mainly consist of thin squamous epithelial cells it can made up of thin squamous epithelial cells of alveoli and next one is the endothelium of your alveoli capillaries and the basement membrane between them so three important layers are present one is the thin squamous epithelial cells of your lung cells that is alveoli cells second one is the endothelial cells of your blood capillaries and third one is the basement membrane so the three layers are been present in the uh, alveoli or the site of exchange of gases so next this thin squamous epithelial cells of alveoli is mainly composed of two types so if you look at this uh, thin uh, the alveoli so you are able to have a small bag like structure it is usually made up of two types of cells one is called as a type 1 squamous epithelial cells another one is called as a type 2 squamous epithelial cells so type 1 are is very thin and it is mainly useful for the exchange of gases whereas type 2 is a slightly thick and it is able to secrete a substance called as a surfactant that is the main role of your uh, what is that the squamous epithelial cell that is surrounding this alveoli okay so what is a surfactant it is a uh, thin film okay that is usually present in this particular area you can see here it is a thin surfactants are non cellular films okay it's mainly made up of proteins and uh, phospholipids so this uh, cellular films that is made up of proteins and phospholipids that is covering the alveoli membrane that is the main role of your surfactants so these surfactants usually lowers the surface tension uh, that is present in the alveoli and it prevents the lungs from collapsing so you are having a squamous epithelial cells two types type 1 type 2 under that the type 2 is able to produce a surfactants surfactants are uh, thin film that is mainly made up of proteins and glycoproteins so this usually helps to prevent the surface tension occurring in the alveoli okay so uh, as a result what is happening it prevents the formation of pulmonary oedema and all those things but newborn baby and it also prevents the collapsing of the lungs mainly the because of the pressure changes the lungs may get collapsed all this collapsing of lungs are being prevented only by means of the surfactants but in case of the premature baby in case of a premature baby so babies that is formed uh, well in advance okay with, without uh, before the maturation so we call as a premature babies so these premature babies will be having a low level of surfactants in the alveoli so here they will be having low level of surfactants in the alveoli as a result what will happen the surface tension of the alveoli will be get increased and it results in the formation of a disease called as a newborn respiratory distress syndrome so it is in short form it is called as a nrds newborn respiratory distress syndrome so because of this syndrome the babies will be having uh, suffocations or having some problems in the breathing okay and this usually occur because the premature baby is usually formed 
and uh, because of low level surfactants and uh, Normally, the synthesis of surfactants begins only after the 25th week of gestation. So, after the 26th week of your gestation only, uh, your uh, surfactants begins to start in the baby. Okay. So, this is important. This is NRDS. Okay. Next to that is a mechanism of breathing. So, so far what you have discussed is uh, what is meant by breathing. Why we need breathing? Okay. In order to release energy from the uh, food, we need breathing. Okay how uh, the various organs are present in different animals what are the various di what are the different organs present in animals how, how they are able to aid in exchanging the gases we have discussed then we have discussed about the human respiratory system its uh, anatomical st uh, structure of your human respiratory systems all those things we have discussed what are the steps that is involved in the respirations we have discussed and finally we have discussed about the alveoli and what is the important cells that is alveoli is mainly made up of and in the human respiratory systems, we have discussed about the conductive zone as well as the respiratory zone. And finally, we have discussed about, we are going to end with the lungs. Finally, it is going to end with the lungs. Okay. So, for lungs usually, uh, you can see that lungs usually present uh, in your thoracic region. And it is usually enclosing this bronchi. So, the structure that is talking, starting from this bronchi and it is usually ending with the alveole. No? They are collectively called as a lungs. Okay. Now we will uh, we'll see what are these lungs and how it is usually mainly made up of. So lungs are usually uh, present in, as a light spongy tissues. Okay. Lungs are a light spongy tissues that is enclosed in the thoracic cavity. So if you look at these uh, lungs, eh, they are having a spongy tissue. If you have a red color spongy tissue, that is called as a lungs. Okay. Uh, if you if you look at this one, this uh, usually you see this is a spongy tissue. They they call it a lungs. They, so usually you have a two lungs in your thoracic region. So this is the head and this is thoracic. In the thoracic region, these lungs are located. Okay. So these two lungs, uh, which is present in the thoracic region, no, it is usually bound. These lungs are usually bound to the sternum, which is the present on the topmost layer of your. First, these lungs are usually present in the thoracic cavity. So, it is a basically a lung cavity. So, it is, it is a skeletal cavity. So, lungs are placed very safely in a thoracic cavity. Okay. And in the inside the thoracic cavity, the topmost layer of lungs get attached to the sternum and the lungs is getting bound on the back side or on the uh, back side of your, uh, it is a, you can, you can say it is a ventral side. Okay. So, the ventral side of lungs. Uh, it is get attached to the vertebral column and the lungs are usually attached on the sides to the ribs okay so in this way it is and in the bottom layer these lungs are usually attached to the diaphragm okay so the lungs bound dorsally ventrally dorsally it is attached to the sternum ventrally it is attached to the vertebrae in side way it is attached to the ribs and in the bottom it is attached to the diaphragm so in this way the lungs have been safely placed in the thoracic cavity okay Next, uh, what is that? The lungs are usually covered uh, by means of uh, two important double membrane system. And uh, we call this membrane as a plural membrane. Okay. These two membrane, plural, uh, this, this double membrane is called as a plural membrane. And this plural membrane is usually made up of uh, uh, many layer of elastic connective tissues and uh, capillaries. So, this plural membrane is mainly made up of elastic connective tissues and uh, capillaries and uh, in between these two uh, membranes plural membranes that is called as the outer membrane and inner membrane you will be having a space and it is called as a uh, we can simply call it as a uh, plural cavity or plural fluid okay so this space is usually filled with a plural fluid and we call this as a plural uh, plural cavity so in between the two membranes, you'll be having a space and it is called as a pleural cavity. And this pleural cavity is usually filled with a, a fluid called as a pleural fluid. This pleural fluid usually uh, reduces the friction when the lungs expand and the contracts. So what is the main role of this pleural fluid that is present in between this membrane? It just gives a, uh, uh, it just, uh, it just may, uh, try to uh, reduces the frictions when the lung is able to undergo expansion as well as a contraction and a expansion. That is the main role of your pleural fluid. So that is all about your human respiratory system. Uh, what is the important characteristic features of your respiratory surfaces? When you come to the character features of respiratory surfaces, mainly the alveoli is mainly acting as a respiratory surfaces. So 
the surface area must be very large one of the important character features of your uh, uh, what is that alveoli is the surface area must be very large and it will be richly supplied with the blood vessels so the alveoli should be supplied with the it will be very large and it will have a good blood supply second important function is that respiratory surface should be very thin and it will be very it should be keep moist third important uh, functions of your respiratory surface uh, your uh, respiratory surface is it should have a direct contact with the environment because uh, if it is been uh, not having direct contact with the environment the oxygen will not be transported directly and it should be permeable to respiratory gases so since uh, they are able to have a direct contact with the external environment the oxygen will be entering into that and this oxygen should be transported to the blood so that should be uh, easily permeable this should, the particular uh, respiratory surface should be easily permeable to respiratory gases so it should be very very thin that means automatically if it is very thin it will be easily permeable to respiratory gases so these are the important uh, characteristic features of your respiratory uh, surfaces okay so when you come to this mechanism of breathing the movement of air between the atmosphere and the lungs is known as breathing okay so when you go for uh, uh, discussing in detail about the mechanism of breathing you should know what is uh, mean by the breathing so breathing is the when you come to this mechanism of breathing so breathing is the process by which the movement of air between the atmosphere and the lungs usually takes place so there is a movement of air between the atmosphere and the lungs okay and there is a movement or exchange of air between the atmosphere and lung usually takes place then it is called as a breathing so breathing mainly in includes two important phases one is called as a inspiration another one is called as a expiration so what is meant by inspiration it is a movement of air that is entering into the lungs movement of air from the atmosphere that is entering into the lungs okay so the movement of atmospheric air into the lungs is called as a inspiration so then what is expiration so it is a movement of the alveolar air okay it is a movement of alveolar alveolar air that is diffuse out from the lungs it is called as a expiration so inspiration is intake of atmospheric air expiration is the relief release of your alveolar air that is uh, diffuse out from the lungs okay now uh, lungs usually do not have any muscle fibers they do not have any muscle fibers so but they usually uh, able to undergo contraction and relaxation only by the movement of the muscle only by the movement of the ribs and the diaphragm so ribs are the small uh, vertical bones that is usually present that usually covers the side way of your thoracic cavity so the movement of the lungs is usually been done or the contraction and expansion of the lungs is usually been carried out only with the help of the movement of this ribs and the diaphragm so what is meant by this diaphragm the diaphragm is a sheet of tissue that separates the thoracic if you look at this diagram this is the di diaphragm okay this is called as the ribs so okay so the movement of lungs is usually carried is usually been uh, done with the help of your uh, ribs as well as the diaphragm so diaphragm is the thin sheet of tissue that usually separates the thoracic from the abdominal so this is a head this is thoracic and this is abdominal so the abdominal and the thoracic region is usually separated by a thin sheet of tissue and it is called as a diaphragm okay so the movement of the lungs is usually carried out with the help of ribs and the diaphragm so the diaphragm usually uh, when it is in relaxed state it becomes a dome shaped it will become a dome shaped so if you look at the structure so this uh, this is a dome shaped structure so here the diaphragm is in a relaxed state okay next so you have to discuss about uh, the mechanism of breathing so the breathing is usually uh, the ribs are usually uh, uh, usually having presence of some muscles uh, and we call these muscles as external muscles and the internal intercostal muscles external intercostal muscle and internal intercostal muscles they are the two muscles that are present between the ribs and the diaphragm and these two muscles that is usually helps in creating the pressure gradient okay so the pressure gradient inside the lungs are usually being created by two muscles that is present in between the ribs and the diaphragm these two muscles are called as a external and internal intercostal muscles okay
you can see this presence of muscles here will be having the muscles this these are the called as the intercostal muscles they are present in between the ribs and it will also present in, the, in between the diaphragm so between the ribs and the diaphragm these external and intercostal muscles are present and this usually creates a pressure gradient inside the lungs so now we will move on to the mechanism of the breathing so the mechanism of breathing usually includes inspiration and the expiration so we will st first starts with the inspiration we already discussed what is inspiration right it is the intake of the atmospheric air into the lungs okay it's called as inspiration and it usually starts with the respiratory center so the respiratory center is usually present in the uh, middle oblongata so there is a respiratory center it usually initiates the stimulations during respiration so the respiratory center initiates the uh, what is that uh, respiratory inspiration process okay so once the respiratory center initiates the initiation process the inspiration process starts so during inspiration what is happening the diaphragm and the uh, expiratory muscles contract the diaphragm and the uh, external uh, intercostal muscles okay is a inter internal intercostal muscle we have external intercostal muscles so the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles usually will contract so as a result what will happen the thoracic volume increases uh, uh, as the chest wall expands so first the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles usually tend to contract where is the diagram i will just show it in the diagram okay if you look at this structure so during the inspiration so you will be having a diaphragm here and you will be having a presence of these uh, external intercostal muscles here so the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm will be able to undergo contraction okay just when you have a deep breath the diaphragm which is in the dome shape will try to undergo contraction okay so uh, as a result the rib cage as well as uh, the uh, rib cage as well as the thoracic cavity you know it will be the thoracic cavity will be enlarged and the rib cage will be moving upward and uh, outward okay you see here so when the diaphragm uh, ex, di when the diaphragm and uh, the ex external intercostal muscles are able to contract the thoracic volume the rib cage will be increased okay the rib cage will be moving uh, upward and uh, sideward and as a result the thoracic volume will be increased thoracic volume means it is here that is mainly the uh, uh, the thoracic region volume will be get increased when the thoracic volume increases uh, because of the expansion of chest wall the lungs which is present inside no okay the interpulmonary pressure which is present inside the lungs will be get reduced when the thoracic volume increases the lung will also get expands when the lung is able to get expands the thoracic uh, the pressure or the intrapulmonary pressure no it will be reduced since uh, you know that pressure is uh, directly related to volume when your lungs volume is get increased the pressure will be get reduced because the area of lung is increased when area is increased the volume the pressure will be get reduced when the area is get decreased pressure will be increased so here when you are able to undergo inspiration thoracic uh, volume increase as a result the intrapulmonary pressure or the lung will be get increased the volume of lung will be get increased as a result the intrapulmonary pressure will be get reduced so when the pulmonary pressure inside the lungs will get reduced the alveolar pressure will also get decreases than the atmospheric pressure okay when the pulmonary pressure or intrapulmonary pressure get decreases the end of the lungs you have a alveolar you know the alveolar pressure will also get decreases and this alveolar pressure is less than that of your atmospheric pressure as a result what is happening so alveolar pressure is less atmospheric pressure is more so there is a pressure gradient is created so the uh, air will be taken from outside the atmosphere into the alveoli or into the alveoli of your lungs in this way the air will be moving from the higher pressure gradient from outside the atmosphere into the inside the lungs and this air will be flowing into the lungs of your uh, air will be flowing inside your lungs of your alveoli until the alveolar pressures equals with respect to your uh, uh, until the atmospheric pressure equals with respect to your alveolar pressure till that the atmospheric air will be entering inside your lungs once the pressure of the atmosphere as well as the alveoli is equal then the flow of uh, the air will be get stop so in this way the mechanism of inspiration usually takes place okay so mainly it's been started or in, in, the inspiration is initiated by respiratory centers and as a result you will be able to uh, intake uh, as a result what will happen the diaphragm and the rib cage the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles will be able to undergo 
contraction and as a result the rib cage will be moving upward and sideward and as a result the thoracic volume will be get increased as a result the lung volume will get increased as a result the pressure which is present inside the lungs is called as intrapulmonary pressure this intrapulmonary pressure will be get reduced and as a result what will happen the alveoli pressure will also be get reduced and this alveoli pressure will be less than that of the atmospheric pressure so since the alveoli pressure or the lung pressure is less than that of the atmospheric pressure so the atmospheric pressure is higher so there is a movement of uh, air or the air pressure from the atmosphere into the alveoli usually takes place and this movement will be taking place until the atmospheric air is equal with respect to the alveoli air until the atmospheric air will be moving inside the lungs once it is uh, the alveolar pressure is equal with respect to the atmospheric pressure then the flow of uh, the atmospheric air will be stopped so in this way the inspiration process is usually taking place in the lungs so when you come to the expiration so it is also been uh, initiated by the respiratory centers here the it is just opposite to that of your inspiration in case of expiration the diaphragm uh, will be initially it will be in contractive phase no after the when you are able to expel the air the diaphragm will be comes to a relaxed doom shape and the uh, intercostal muscles will be here contracting here the external intercostal muscles will be relaxed whereas the internal intercostal muscles here will be contracting so diaphragm will be relaxed and the internal intercostal muscles will be able to undergo contraction okay now since the diaphragm is in relaxed state or in the doom shaped so the rib cage and all this uh, will be moving downward okay and the sideward so as a result what is happening the thoracic volume will be get reduced and as a result the lungs which is present inside the thoracic cavity okay they also will be get reduced so the intrapulmonary pressure since the lung volume get reduced the intrapulmonary pressure that is present inside the lungs will also be get reduced sorry it will be get increased because the lung volume get decreased the pressure will be increasing so the intrapulmonary pressure in the lungs will be get increased as well as the alveolic pressure inside the lungs will also be get increased so when you compare the alveolic pressure with respect to the atmospheric pressure the alveolic pressure will be more than that of the atmospheric pressure as a result the air will be sent from outside there will be uh, moving from the alveoli into the external environment it will be passed out from the alveoli into the external environment until the alveoli uh, the alveoli pressure is equal with respect to the atmospheric pressure till that the alveoli air pressure will be moving out as a uh, moving out into the atmosphere and it will stop until the both the alveoli and the atmospheric pressures are equal so in this way your uh, expiration process usually takes place so this is the mechanism of your breathing okay these all these things that are discussed here okay on an average a healthy human usually breathes about 12 to 16 times per minute per minute an average indi an a, an a, a healthy individual on an average is able to breathe about 12 to 16 times per minute okay so the instrument called as a spirometer is an instrument that is used to, to measure the volume of air that is being taken or it is used to measure the volume of air that is been taken during the inspiration and the expiration or it is used to measure the volume of air during breathing and that instrument name is called as a spirometer okay so now we have discussed about uh, the mechanism of breathing then move on, and then we will uh, we'll see about what is meant by respiratory volume so what is meant by respiratory volume and capacities so respiratory volume is the volume of air that is present during the various phases of your respiration and it is called as a uh, respiratory volume so, so during the, the respiration you have a different phases so the volume of air that is present in the various phases of respiration okay is called as a respiratory volumes so we are going to discuss about some terminologies related to this respiratory volume so they are going to talk with the respect to the tidal volume inspiratory respiratory volume in, in, inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume what is meant by tidal volume in short form they call it as a tv so it is a tidal volume is the amount of air that is uh, inspired or expired during a normal breathing okay it is approximately 500 ml so you can see this picture from this you can able to understand so this is a figure that is usually showing the lung volume and the capacity this figure usually shows the lung volume and the capacity so here you can see so it's a it's a inspiration and this is a expiration so okay 
so this is the inspiration when air is going above it is a inspiration the volume of air is been increased when it is showing down it is a volume of air that is get expired so the uh, what is that tidal volume tv means it is the amount of air that is been inspired and expired during normal breathing so it is usually about 500 ml okay so this is called as a tidal volume tv so normally uh, you will be able to undergo 12 breaths per minute so you multiply 500 to 12 you may able to end up with uh, nearly uh, what is that uh, 6000 to 8000 ml of air per minute so when you are able to go for tidal volume you may able to breathe about uh, 6000 to 8000 8, ml of air per minute you are able to breathe okay when you are able to do vigorous exercise when you are able to have a vigorous exercise the tidal volume will be increases into 4 to 10 times okay okay next what is number inspiratory reserve volume IRV so or the expiratory reserve volume inspiration as the name indicates is the intake of uh, air inside the lungs so additional volume of air a person can inspire by forceful inspiration when you are able to do normal breathing you are able to take only 500 ml when you are able to undergo forceful breathing okay so the, what is the additional amount of air that you are able to take apart from the normal breathing that is called as a inspiratory reserve volume normally the value normal value for the inspiratory reserve volume is 2500 to 3000 ml so so you can see from this diagram so this is a normal 500 ml you can able to breathe but when you are forcefully able to undergo inspiration this is called as a inspiratory reserve volume so it is about 2500 to you can see the values here that is 3000 ml so it will be 2500 to 3000 ml so this is called as a inspiratory reserve volume and then what is the uh, expiratory reserve volume you see here this is called as expiratory reserve volume from here to here it is called as expiratory reserve volume okay so it is a maximum amount of air that you are able to expire uh, by means of forceful expiration that is called as expiratory reserve volume so its value is about 1100 ml okay it is about 1500 ml you can able to do here that is called as a expiratory reserve volume okay then what is called as a residual volume so it is a volume of air that is remain in the lungs after a forceful expiration so when you are able to do a forceful expiration so what is the amount of air so you see here residual volume so you have a irv forceful inspiration you have a erv forceful expiration apart from this you may have a small residual amount of volume of air that remains even after the forceful expiration so that is called as a residual volume and this residual volume of air usually uh, normal value for the residual volume is about 1100 to 1200 ml so you should know what is meant by uh, tidal volume you should know what is meant by inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve volume and then you should know what is residual volume next we'll move on to the respiratory capacities we we'll move to our respiratory capacities so first you start with the inspiratory capacity and you start with the expiratory capacity what is the inspiratory capacity it is a total volume of air a person can inhale after normal expiration normally when you expire and after that what you are able to try to inhale so what is the total volume of air that you are able to inhale okay that is called as the inspiratory capacity okay so normally the inspiratory capacity is uh, you can able to calculate with the total volume and the irv you see from this diagram so this is the inspiratory capacity so normally you are able to expire here 500 ml you are able to expire after, after the expiration normal expiration what is the total amount of air that you can able to uh, intake what is the total amount of air that is present after the normal expiration no? that is called as a inspiration capacity so uh, the inspiration capacity ic is equal to vt or v uh, that is the, the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume so that is the value here okay then what is meant by expiratory capacity uh, what is meant by this one is called as a expiratory capacity this is inspiratory capacity then this will be the expiratory capacity okay so what will the expiratory capacity from here to here it is the amount of air that is been uh, present in the lungs after the uh, normal expiration or a normal inspiration you see here what is the expiration capacity it is the total volume of air a person can excel the total volume of air a person can excel after normal inspiration okay so it includes uh, mainly the tidal volume plus erv so here 
it is you have to include this tidal volume this from from here to here plus the expiratory reserve volume from here to here so from here to here we call it as a expiratory uh, it is called as a uh, expiratory capacity so next is uh, what is mean by the vital capacity so you see another term here vital capacity it starts from here and it ends with here so what is my vital capacity it is the total volume of air it is a maximum volume of air it's a maximum volume of air that can be uh, released out during a single breath following a maximum inspiration so vital capacity means what after a maximum expiration how much amount of air you are able to intake that is called as a vital capacity so here a person first inspires forcefully a person first here he inspires maximum maximally will inspires all the air, what is it the air present in the lungs so a person first inspires uh, maximum he inspires maximally and then he expires maximally so it is followed by inspiration that is followed by expiration that is called as a vital capacity so here vital capacity is equal to expiratory reserve volume plus inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume so that is the called as a vital capacity you can see from this diagram so this is the inspiratory reserve volume okay this is the expiratory reserve volume plus tidal capacity so this all includes the vital capacity maximum amount of uh, 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 what is that uh, air he is able to inspire irv maximum amount of air he will expire that is called as a erv then it includes the tidal volume so all this comes together and forms a vital capacity so that's all about your inspirate uh, what is that uh, inspiration uh, that is about inspiratory capacity expiratory capacity and uh, vital capacities so this that's all about your respiratory capacities and finally we will move on to a total lung capacity so what is meant by total lung capacity so it is a total volume of air which a lung can accommodate after a forceful inspiration after a forceful inspiration what is the total volume of air a lungs can accommodate totally how much amount of air a lung can accommodate after a forceful inspiration it is called as a total lung capacity okay so it includes a vital capacity plus rv okay it is in, it is including the both the vital capacity as well as the residual volume you see here so it is a total vital capacity plus the residual volume okay so from here to till here it is called as a total lung capacity okay so that's all about your total, uh, lung volume and the capacity okay then there is a space uh, you call as a dead space what is mean dead space it's a space it's a gas or the inspired air which is present in the respiratory tract or the passages and they will not be involved in any exchange of gases okay such type of uh, yeah, space is called as a dead space okay a space or an inspired air will not be never entering into the alveoli area it will be present in the respiratory passages and this will uh, presents uh, will not be able to undergo any exchanges because it is not going to the alveoli and it is present only in the respiratory tracts so it does not able to undergo any exchange of gases so this air space which is present in the uh, uh, what is that uh, passages no we call it as a dead space okay so it is about 150 ml of uh, this dissolved air will be present in the dead space so so far you have discussed about the mechanism of breathing and the remaining topics uh, that is exchange of gases and the transport of gases and then followed by the regulation of gases and uh, the symptoms that is associated with the respiratory diseases all these things we will discuss in the next slide okay thank you